The natural world, that which is by nature, the, the fact that you have to have an egg to have a baby. <laughs> the natural is not what Abraham held on to. It was the supernatural. Abraham's faith that we are to follow in his steps of is not a faith found in this world. It is not a natural trust, but rather a supernatural confidence. And supernatural faith must come from a supernatural source. It must come from the supernatural word of God. That's where it comes from. All hope in this world, in Abraham's case, the ability to have children and thus fulfill God's redemptive promise, was lost. All hope was lost. But against all that kind of hope, Abraham still had hope. Against all odds, he had hope. That's the meaning of that. How could that be said that against all hope, Abraham had hope? How could that be said? It's because his hope, his faith, was not in man's ideas or natural abilities. His hope was based in the fulfillment of what God had promised. His faith was not fideism or blind faith in some unseen force. Understand that? Christians get accused of that. It's not it. His faith was not some kind of foolish, well, I just believe some kind of crazy thing out there. No. His faith was in the very words of God. God had said, so shall thy seed be. And that's what he believed. Quite literally, the text says that his hope was certain that he would be the redemptive father of many nations. Notice the plural there, many nations. It wasn't just, this is not just the promise of becoming the father of the Jews, but talking about the spiritual promise, father of many nations, many peoples who will follow after God. Because it was spoken. That's what his faith was. His faith was in the spoken word of God. Your seed will come into being. It will happen. That which did not exist will exist. You will have a son. You will have children from them down through the centuries. There will come the one of the seed of the woman who will save his people from their sins. Abraham's faith that we are to walk in, in the steps of, relies upon the actual word of God. Friends, that is why every Sunday when we come here, and if you come here, this will happen, okay? And when it doesn't happen, we'll stop coming here. Every Sunday when you come here, we will open up the book of God. We will open up the word of God. That is why I don't stand up here and tell inspirational stories and help you find your best life now and tell you how to increase your lifestyle. I have no burning passion inside of me to, to stand here and go on and on on how to be a good and how to plan for and enjoy your retirement or how to overcome the obstacles. My desire... My burning passion, my job, my responsibility that I pray to God I'll be faithful in until the day I, I die <coughs> is to point people to God through God's revealed promise of His Word. So that in hearing the Word, the revelation of God, your faith and my faith will grow. Because that's the only way faith grows. That is where faith comes from. Paul will say later in Romans, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith only comes through the promise of God's Word, and we see that right here. Where did, what was the nature of Abraham's faith? Where did it come from? He believed that God said, so shall thy seed be, that's it. He believed, you know what that means? He basically took God at His Word. God said it, and so he believed it. What a radical way to live. God says it, I'll believe it. Oh, you know what? I think my life would change drastically if I lived that out constantly. <laughs> if I just believe that God is God and I am not, and His Word is truth, and therefore as He says it, it's true, I know my life would change. I pray that God would help me. Biblical faith is not only resting in the divine person, it is relying upon the divine promise of God's Word. To put it bluntly, this book will increase your faith and enable you to believe in God. But apart from the steady diet, both inside and outside of these walls, apart from the steady diet of this word, your faith, my faith, will shrivel up to nothing. Woe to the shepherds who do anything but preach and teach this word in its original meaning, its original context, and its natural understanding. Woe to the shepherds who do not wrestle with the word for hours and days before entering the pulpit. 
Woe to the shepherds who do not tremble each time they open their mouth to speak the word. Because this word, when interpreted in its normal context and natural grammar, will produce the supernatural results of divine play, faith being implanted and growing in all who hear it. God and His word, His promise, are not at odds with one another. For we cannot know God or faith in God absent from the Holy Bible. This is how we know God. John MacArthur once said something in a sermon that stuck with me. It was a sermon to preachers, to pastors. It said this, Ministers have one job and one job only. To master this book, then communicating it to God's people. It's well said, and that which causes me to tremble with this blessed but very important responsibility. And each one of us ought to tremble at the word of God. Faith is resting in the divine object, divine person of God. Justifying faith is resting in the divine promise, the word of God. And justifying faith is residing within the divine produce of God. What he will produce. What he will do. Verses 19 through 20. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Wait, wait, wait a second. Doesn't this seem kind of contradictory? We just talked about, we're talking about Abraham, right? The guy who lied because he was afraid that he would lose his wife to Pharaoh. The guy who, with his wife, connived a plan to find a way to get seed through her servant. I'm kind of confused here because it says he was not weak in faith and staggered not at the promise. What are we talking about here? It says being not weak in faith. It helps to read verses 19 and 20 together, to look at it all together, and to notice the last phrase of verse 20, which says, but was strong in faith, and we'll get to that in just a minute. When it says in verse 20, he staggered not, meaning he did not waver in remembering and believing God's promise, but he was strong in faith. Now, it's important to understand this. When I was studying this out, and I was trying to wrestle with this and understand how this could be, as I was reading this, I came across an interesting aspect in the original language here. That phrase, but was strong in faith. The translation here might cause us to misunderstand what is being said here. It's important to recognize what Scripture is teaching. The phrase, strong in faith, is passive. It's actually a passive combination of the root word to be strong, the power, ability, and the prefix en, or the word prefix translated many different ways in the Greek. Um, in, into, unto, all kinds of ways. Okay? But it's a combination of those two. It's an unusual word that that's put together only one time in Scripture right here. <laughs> Literally, with the passive sense of the word, what it means is Abraham was endued with strength in faith. Abraham was strengthened in his faith. So, what it's saying here, and this is the way this puts it, this was a process. Abraham grew in his faith. And you notice, when it's, because it's in the passive tense, you know what the passive tense means? That means that it's not something he did. It's something that was done to him. So what this is meaning here is that he staggered not, he wavered not, because God was strengthening his faith. God was giving him the strength to have this faith. And so what this means, I believe, the implications are this. As Abraham went, yes, he stumbled, he fell, but you know, he never turned back. You know, he never went away. He never gave up on the whole thing. He never said, that's it, God, you're not going to do it, I'm going back to Ur. He never got rid of Sarah and got another wife who was younger. He never gave up. Although he stumbled along the way, God strengthened his faith. God endued him with the power to believe. And as he went on, he grew and he grew and he grew in his faith. God brings the divine produce of the faith, not us. Abraham was not naturally strong in faith. But he was endued with strength. He was increasing in faith. This helps me understand how Paul can say that Abraham wavered not and was not weakened in faith. Rather, as he was going along in life, as the years passed and the promise unfulfilled year after year, almost 14 years later, before whatever, anything ever happened, he still held to the promise of God. Even though I know, we know from the Old Testament account, and I know from my own experience, 
he probably woke up some days and said, is it really going to happen? <laughs> is this really going to happen today? And we know that at one point, he and Sarah got up and they decided it's not going to happen. We better do this ourselves. But then at the end, he said, no, 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 after all that happened and God rebuked, no, it's going to happen. I love that because that describes me. <laughs> really, God, are you coming back? <laughs> when? Is it ever going to happen? Oh, really? You're really going to provide this and that? Friends, it's not the strength of faith that determines whether you're justified or not. It's the object of faith, God. It's the promise given by God. And it's the produce, the promise that God will grow your faith. He will strengthen your faith. And so I say to individuals, individuals that have not crossed that line into Christianity, individuals who have not turned and, and, and said, yes, I'm going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to turn from my way of thinking and I'm going to rest in Jesus Christ's promise of justification. For those that are still struggling with that, I say, you go ahead and read the Word. You keep studying it. You keep reading in it. God will endue you with the strength to believe. He will do it. You just keep with it. You keep reading it. Maybe for the Christian, there's a principle we can apply as well. The God who gives us justifying grace through faith will give us sanctifying grace through faith. He will grow us too. He will change us. He will make us more like Him. Thus, the result, giving glory to God, right? So it says in verse, 20, in verse 20, uh, 20, yeah. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, was strengthened in the faith, giving glory to God. The produce of God's growing faith in your life and my life is an increasing glory of God. God is glorified when people just take him at his word. Just believe what he says. And therefore, verse 20 one, I'm sorry, verse 21, and being fully persuaded, convinced, God strengthening him in his faith, convinced him that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, there's that word therefore again, it was imputed to him for righteousness. This is the kind of faith Abraham had. This was the kind of faith he had. Faith in the person of God, faith in the promise of God, and faith in the reality that God will produce. God will do it. Now, how does this apply to us? What are the implications of Abraham's faith? Verses 23 through 25 give us the implications of Abraham's faith, right? Because he says, I love it when the word uh, interprets itself <laughs> and applies itself. He says, now it was not now. That's the application, right? Now, okay, now what do we do with this? Now, it was not written for his sake alone. It's not just about Abraham. That it was imputed to him or imputed to him in this manner because of this faith. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed. Do you see a promise there? A promise, a divine promise? It shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. How do you have God's imputed righteousness put to your account? You believe on, believe on him, believe on God that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, the one who gives life. This is amazing. God caused the deadness of Sarah's womb to come alive. He made life where it didn't exist. God created this world and gave life where it did not exist. Cannot then God give spiritual life where it does not exist? If he can raise the physical dead, cannot he raise you and me in our spiritual deadness to serve and worship God? Can he not raise us up? He is the God who gives life. And then it describes the basis of of that faith for the Christian, for the one who believes is in the person of Jesus Christ who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Once again, that idea of life giving right there, raised again. The implication is this. Based on this kind of faith, faith that rests upon God, faith that relies upon God's word, and faith that resides in God's divine production is the kind of faith that justifies the sinner. That's what it is. And the encouragement is this. It is for us. It is for you. It is for me. It is for us. If the object of our faith is God, not our ability or our religion, and specifically faith in deliverance,